Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my February 2021 Planetarium show. We've got the sky set to the 3rd of February at uh, just before five o'clock and we're letting time run forward towards sunset now. So the sun, sun will begin to set and the sky is going to darken and the first stars are going to start appearing. Here they come. And we've chosen to stop at this point because there's a pass by the International Space Station. And so if we look over to the west, here is the ISS rising up quite rapidly across the sky. One or two other satellites there, it seems to be racing, another little tiny one there, look, that's Starlink 104. But the ISS was launched in 1998 and is 260 miles above the Earth's surface, doing 17,100 miles an hour. Amazing for a 400 tonne spacecraft. It has the Dragon module attached to it from SpaceX, which recently delivered some astronauts up there. And now it's, whoop, that was a near miss with a Russian rocket. Um, not really, it was a different distance, but it's beginning to descend down towards the horizon, it's going to vanish any moment. There it goes, it winks out as it enters the shadow of the Earth, just before it reaches the horizon, in fact, that very suddenly disappears, quite astonishing when you watch it. But we'll now begin the sky tour over at the west, and we'll pull back a little bit and let you see the constellation that's the first one on our tour, and that is the constellation of Aquarius, the water carrier. There's the water carrier pouring his water from his jug. And I've chosen to start here because Aquarius is one of the constellations of the Zodiac. And the Zodiac constellations, there are 13 of them in total, are the realm of the planets. The planets all orbit around the sun in a flat plane. And so we see them on a line in the sky called the ecliptic. That's the orange line that you see there. So if we zoom in a little bit onto Aquarius and just go south of the line here, here is Neptune, almost perfectly aligned. Neptune, the outermost of the major planets, seen as a blue disc with a small telescope, um, and you need a very powerful telescope to get a view like this. We can see some of its moons marked there. These are mostly little tiny moonlets that were discovered, first of all, by the Voyager spacecraft. You can also see a little tiny sets of rings there. All the giant planets have rings, not just Saturn, uh, but Saturn's are by far the most spectacular. So these very, very thin rings, they were initially found looking back through them towards the sun by the Voyager spacecraft. It has a very large moon called Triton, which if it orbited the sun, we would call a planet. It's about the same size as the planet Mercury, but it orbits Neptune, except it does it backwards. And you can see the surface markings there. Those dark black bits are liquid nitrogen geysers bringing dirty material up from the subsurface. Quite amazing. So we'll pull back away from Triton and Neptune now, and we're going to look a little bit further along the line of the ecliptic through the next constellation, which is Pisces the fish. Here it is, just a little higher than Aquarius. There's the fish with their tails seemingly tied together with a bit of seaweed. It's really just two lines of stars across the sky, of course. So that's the constellation of Pisces, the next one in the parade of the constellations of the Zodiac. We're gonna continue on just to the uh, higher into the sky here and we'll find a small constellation Aries, the third one along in terms of the constellations of the zodiac. It's really just a little line of stars but uh, ancient people imagined that this drew out the shape of a goat. So there's Aries the goat and its feet just touching that orange line that marks the path of the planets. And of course we can see one of those planets there, the third one of our planetary parade for this month, and that is the red planet Mars. You can already see it just as the red orange disc there. So we're now gonna zoom in. Uh, first of all, we're gonna zoom in on Uranus, and this looks a little bit like Neptune, except greener. But here it is, this faint green disc, and an array of moons that you can see with an amateur telescope, Miranda, Ariel, Oberon, Umbriel, and Titania. 
all discovered shortly after Uranus was found itself by William Herschel. If we zoom right in on the planet, we can just see some faint cloud belts running around it. And it also has a set of rings, as I said, more impressive than Neptune's, but nowhere near those of the rings of Saturn, of course. Again, this was all discovered by the Voyager probe. It was the first to fly out into the depths of the outer solar system. Let's have a look at one of its moons, its largest, and that's Titania. And this is of 980 miles in diameter, so about half the size of the Earth's moon, covered in craters. But those craters seem to be soft because they've landed in an ice layer underneath which there is a liquid water ocean. And that's a possible habitat for some form of life. We don't know whether there's anything there, but it's worth exploring when we get the chance. So we'll pull back away from Uranus and zip next door to the third planet on our list, and that's Mars. And we can now zoom right in on Mars. We can already see Phobos and Deimos, the two moons of Mars there, and some of the detailed markings on the surface. In the upper region, there are three dots in a line. Those are the Tharsis volcanoes of the uh, amazing volcanic region of Mars. I'll point at them for you here, these three. And this one is the largest, the fourth one, that's Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. And here is Valles Marinaris, the Martian Grand Canyon. The distance from one end to the other would go all the way from New York to San Francisco. It's absolutely enormous. So we'll pull back away from Mars, the red planet, and get a nice wide view of the sky. And now what we're going to let happen is we're going to let time run forward to nine o'clock just so that we get to the fully dark uh, state of the sky. We're gonna let the constellations of the uh, winter Taurus and Orion there move into a better position. So we'll bring those across and head towards nine. You can already see quite a collection of bright stars there. We're gonna visit most of those. So let's start with Taurus, Taurus the bull. So we can see the V-shape there that makes up the face of the bull with the two enormous horns sticking up to the top there. Let's have the artwork to show you how that works. The back half of the bull is missing. It kind of butts into Aries the ram there. Another of the constellations of the zodiac, but there are no planets in this at the moment. The bright orange star, that's the left-hand one of that triangle is Aldebaran. But here we have the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, a cluster of young, hot blue stars visible to the naked eye, backed by thousands of small, fainter ones. You can see white ones and then the really faint yellowy orange ones are like the sun. The, the bright ones are much more powerful. You can even see some of the gas left over from the star formation process there. That's about 440 light years away from the Earth. And it's 150 million years old since the stars were formed. So they're very young indeed. Here is the remains of an exploded star over by the horns of the bull. This is the Crab Nebula. It was spotted by Chinese astronomers as a new star that appeared in the sky for three months in the year 1054 AD. But nowadays we see the rem remnant of that explosion that uh, brightened up became visible even in daylight to the Chinese astronomers before fading away. Now we're going to look at perhaps my favourite constellation of all, and that is the constellation of Orion. Perfectly placed at this time, we see Orion's belt there, the three stars in a neat line across the middle. There it is lined up with the artwork. And you see the other four corner stars marking his knees and his shoulders. We'll have a look at the top left hand corner star, that's Betelgeuse, very red in colour. It's a red giant star and it's due to explode as a supernova sometime very soon, in the next million years or so. That's soon for astronomers. And actually last year it began misbehaving and we thought maybe it was about to uh, explode, but it's settled down again now. Uh, it suddenly became very dim. So that's Betelgeuse, the, the uh, supergiant red star there at the end of its life up in the left-hand corner of Orion. The other end of things is 
where new stars are being born, and that's the Orion Nebula, one of the most beautiful objects in the sky, actually. You can see all these wispy uh, gas glowing in different colours. You see dirty, dusty uh, dust lanes swirling around in front of the uh, brighter regions behind. New stars have been born in the centre here by the collapse under gravity of all of that material, and they have lit up, and it's their strong light that's causing that nebula, that thin cloud of gas and dust to glow in such a beautiful manner. The whole of Orion is full of these sorts of uh, regions. We're going to look at the left-hand belt star of the three there, Al Nitak, and you can already see that there's something going on nearby. We'll zoom right in on it now. And you can see there the Horsehead Nebula, the dark, dusty region, looks a bit more like a seahorse's head on its side in front of that red glowing hydrogen gas. It's all being lit up by the powerful light of the bright star at the top of the screen there. To the left of that is the Flame Nebula. You can see why it's called that. It's got the shape of a flame. Very beautiful indeed. So we'll now just uh, move along to the next object on the tour of Orion, and that's a different type of nebula. Again, new stars have been formed out of collapsing gas here, but the blue color is the, is the striking feature here. There's a very hot blue star hiding behind the dirty regions there, the dirty, dusty finger that's blocking our view of it, and the blue light is bouncing back to us off the gas behind. You also see just that red uh, streak across the sky. That's called Barnard's Loop. Orion is just full of these enormous clouds of uh, dirty, dusty material. Down to the foot of Orion, we have one of his hunting dogs, Canis Major. You can just about make out the outline of the dog now that the sticks uh, diagram is on the screen. There's the dog. And you just see the feet of Orion up to the top right there. And we can see the bright star Sirius. It's the brightest star apart from our sun that we can see. And it's bright because it's nearby. It is a little bigger than the sun, a little bit more powerful, but not much. Um, but it's only 8.6 light years away from us. And that's why it's seen as so, such a bright star. Other bright stars are much further away and yet vastly more powerful. Some of them are 100,000 times the power output of the sun. And we see them at thousands of light years away because of that. So that's Sirius, the dog star. And Orion has two dogs. He has Canis Major that we've already seen, and now Canis Minor, which really is just two stars linked by a stick there. I think they were pushing their luck when they invented the second dog. But there he is, the little dog. And it has another bright star in it called Procyon. Uh, Procyon is very, very similar to Sirius in mass, in temperature, all of those characteristics. It's just that it's 11 and a half light years away. And so it seems that it's uh, much dimmer because of the extra distance, but it's almost the twin of Sirius. And in fact, both Sirius and Procyon are double stars and they each have a little companion called a white dwarf orbiting around them that we can't easily see unless we have a powerful telescope. So those were the two hunting dogs. And between the two of them is a constellation that contains almost no bright stars at all, the constellation of Monoceros. There's the stick diagram linking up a group of relatively faint stars, as you can see, but Monoceros is a unicorn. So Orion is going hunting and he's got two dogs and a unicorn with him, very wise. Now I picked to look at this constellation because it has one of the most beautiful objects in the sky, the Rosette Nebula. This is a star forming region that's a little bit in between that of the Orion Nebula that's just given birth to stars and the Pleiades star cluster that we've already seen. Here you can see the cluster of bright stars emerging from what looks like a bubble in the center of that uh, cloud of gas. It's called the Rosette Nebula, you can see why, because it does look like a rose, but those stars have blown that bubble with their strong radiation. And you can just see they're blowing away the rest of the gas that was uh, part of their formation. 
We also have here the Christmas tree cluster. Now, as with a lot of things in astronomy, it's upside down. So the tip of the Christmas tree is here and the base is here. And these stars are supposed to make the shape of the Christmas tree. Here's the Hubble Space Telescope view that I've brought in for you. You can see the cone nebula at the bottom here, like this, this cone of material. You can see it in color there in the uh, low resolution view. So that's the cone nebula. And if you have a pair of binoculars, both of those are well worth trying to find. You can navigate to them by finding Betelgeuse in Orion and then traveling to the uh, east, so left across the sky as we're looking at it. There's Betelgeuse there. And you see, you just come this way, at the halfway between Betelgeuse and Procyon, just about in this region here. So there we have some excellent objects to go looking for in the sky. Now I've turned on the rest of the constellations for you. We have Gemini here, the next constellation along in the uh, sequence of the constellations of the zodiac. We look a bit further up, we have Auriga with the bright star Capella. That's called the goat star. These little three here are the kids. And you can see in the graphic, the herdsman Auriga is carrying these uh, three goats in his arms. So I hope you've enjoyed that and uh, we'll bring the show to an end now and I'll just let time run forward towards the dawn and uh, we'll see you next month for the March edition.